Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Raka Ray, and I'm a professor of sociology and South Asian studies here at Berkeley. And it's my great pleasure uh, today to introduce uh, today's speaker, who comes through, uh, uh, to us through the Shubir and Malini Center for Bangladesh Studies. Last week, we were treated to a wonderful talk by Sabina Rashid from BRAC on the importance of understanding social context in our analysis and diagnosis of illness. Today, I think of it as sort of a continuum to continue conversations about the importance of social location and social context. And today, we have another scholar from BRAC about another deeply socially located practice, the practice and the understanding of the secular and its meanings and its limits. Sami Haq is an anthropologist and associate professor at the Department of Economics and Social Science at BRAC University, Dhaka. She obtained a PhD from Brandeis University, where she wrote a dissertation on women's um, Islamic discussion circles in Dhaka under the guidance of the wonderful anthropologist, Sarah Lamb. Dr. Huck has written wide, widely on, cultural, on the cultural activism of Bengali Muslims, the impact of secular and madrasa education on um, gendered norms and practices, on faith-inspired development actors, and she is currently at work on her book, uh, on a book manuscript based on her dissertation. Um, Dr. Huck coordinates the Brack University, uh, Georgetown University Speakers Forum series on faith and <laughs> development, which consists of public forums and student engagement with local and international scholars and activists on topics relevant to faith and uh, development. And beyond the academy, she's a public intellectual who has written a range of op-eds on sort of topics uh, from gender stereotypes in uh, Bangladeshi textbooks to the future of secular politics in Bangladesh. I first met Dr. Huck when I was on a visit to Dhaka with two of my colleagues, uh, Lawrence Cloyd and Polo Mishaha, a couple of years ago. It was there that the idea of this visit first arose. Dr. Huck wanted to come here so that she could have the opportunity to write and workshop her paper with Saba Mahmood, whose work has so influenced her and much other scholarship on gender and piety. It is her loss and ours that such a conversation could not come to pass when Saba Mahmood died earlier this year. And it is indeed in moments like this that we feel the loss of Saba most keenly, but it is with a sense of joy that we therefore hear Dr. Huck's work today and feel the living legacy and the powerful resonances of Saba Mahmood through her work. Sabi Huck. Thank you, Professor Akare, for that very, very thoughtful introduction. Um, and and for our reminding us and the audience uh, about Dr. Sava Mahmood, and indeed the conversation of coming here for me and continuing to work on piety and what it means in Bangladesh has begun with her for me. Um, it's a great honor for me uh, to be here. It's been the most rewarding trip for me in many ways, in more ways than one. Um, and for that, I'd like to uh, thank the, the Shubir and Malini Chaudhary uh, Center for Bangladesh Studies, the Institute of South Asia Studies here at the University of California at Berkeley, um, Dr. Sanchita Saxena, whom also I met while Sabah Mahmood was still alive at a conference in the US, and we had started talking about collaborating and and, and linking up with uh, Bangladesh, um, establishing links between Brack University where I teach and, and the Chaudhary Center. And we hope that through our visit, we can you know, keep some of those links going and maybe make concrete some more initiatives in, into the future. Uh, Punita Kala, thank you so much for, for being very generous, uh, being a very generous host, um, bearing with all our logistical sort of back and forth, nightmarish kind of situations. But uh, Margot, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, last but not least, um, Professor Rakare, Professor Lawrence Cohen, um, for much 
sort of thoughtful conversation that began, began when you first uh, came to Dhaka, I think it was 2016, January of 2016. We spent a wonderful, what, four or five days, not just talking about work and collaborations and exchanges, but actually getting to know one another. And uh, that's been most wonderful. Um, so my talk today is thinking about the secular practices, dispensations, and possibilities in Bangladesh. Um, some of the issues, or if I were to give you an overview of my paper, um, I look at the genesis of secularism in Bangladesh. I um, sort of discuss the political objectives, the question of religion, or more particularly Islam, in the national imaginary the role of courts, and the role of religious women. Uh, my central questions um, include, is secularism a necessary evil? Um, and I would conclude at the end of my paper that it is. Um, can it, should it be re-envisioned? I would conclude at the end of my paper that yes, it should. And what should inform its definitional and operational contours? So that's sort of what I get into in the paper, and in order to uh, answer and assess that, I'll have to start with a little bit of history. So the story of political secularism as enshrined in the Constitution has been framed by secular advocates as a logical extension of Bangladesh's history, which up until then was marked by cultural, economic, and political marginalization during the Pakistan era. This experience, culminating in the Jamaat-e-Islami's collaboration with the Pakistan army necessitated a distance in the new nation from a brute and narrow Islam that did not side with the people's pursuit of justice. Bangladeshi lawmakers were also reflective of their communal history in the pre-partition days. They felt that enshrining secularism as a political ideal would be the much needed route towards communal harmony and justice for all in the new nation. The practical actions that were required to mobilize the doctrine of secularism involved the classic secular formula of separation of church and state. In terms of political maneuverings, the separation was to be achieved by banning all religious political parties. The Bengali term that was given as a translation of secularism was the hormonirobekkhota, or religious neutrality, which signaled the state's neutrality vis-a-vis -vis religions and religious attachments, without denying any groups their own religious following. In addition, as Kamal Hussein, one of the drafters of the Constitution, writes in his memoirs, the other objective of secularism as, as a constitutional mandate was to preserve individual religious freedom. To this effect, the Constitution secures a range of fundamental rights uh, which claim to reinforce and ensure the full exercise of the, of the right to religion, life, personal liberty, and security, with equal protection from the law. But as the new nation embarks on its journey on a post-colonial modern trajectory through constitutionalism, through legalism, and religious freedom, with religion left out of the political space, the regime's secular credentials get questioned in several ways in subsequent years. The first line of critique centers on the question, what does leaving religion out of politics entail? The regime very early on started to make overtures to religious sensibilities through sites such as mass media, which sent a secular signal by commencing television broadcasts with recitations from the four major religious texts. Additional me measures included the relaunching of the Islamic Foundation, which Ayub Khan founded as the Islamic Academy in 1961 for a study of Islam and its relevance for a modernizing nation. These measures were intended to state to the masses that the regime was not hostile towards religion. religion. Such, over, or such overtures notwithstanding, language, literature, and music, however, did not pay much attention to religious attachments, lending critics to allege that such cultural repositories of secularism that aim to provide a unifying transcending anchor of the national imaginary, in fact, were exclusionary, leaving out religious communities and their various attachments. 
The overstating of Bengaliness also left the indigenous people of the land, neither Bengali nor Muslim, marginalized from the national cons nationalist construction. Dina Siddiqui's recent article on the constitutional debates on secularism highlights that the conversations in Parliament leading to the proclamation of secularism as a constitutional clause was centered on the importance of being Bengali, completely ignoring ethnic identities. Siddiqui shows how the Muslim question was neither debated nor refuted. Rather, there's an inchoate sense of Muslimness where anything from the puritanical Islam of the Wahhabi movement of the 18th century to the syncretism of the Baal traditions is invoked to give Muslimness a certain grounding within the secular and national psyche. But the sole dependence on language and culture as the binding force irked many. And the unquestioned or rather taken for granted stance given to Muslim aspirations was read as a denial of some of the closest and most visceral elements of one's being. Many sensed an Indian conspiracy in this. A certain affinity and indebtedness to India that obscures the reality of Hindu-Muslim divides in the pre-partition days. The struggles and marginalization of the Bengali, Bengali Muslim that spans many movements ranging from the Faraisi to the Muslim League and the general dominance of India in the region in more recent times. This secularism that grounds itself on Bengaliness only failed to take into consideration all the interesting developments in literature, the arts, and politics among Bengali Muslims in the Pakistan era that spoke of an identity that, that is equally Muslim and Bengali. The fact that the Muslim side of Bengali subjectivity was not adequately factored in means that only a certain angle of the Pakistani experience, that is the state's oppressive use of Islam to justify cultural and economic exploitation, was considered. Research now reveals that the Pakistani experience also had other kinds of engagements with Islam. Take, for example, groups such as Tamatune Majlish, who were the first to ask for Bengali as a state language in 1948 many of whose members were successors of Abdul Wadud and his Shikha Goshti, a Muslim collective of writers from the 1930s. There was also other intellectual thinking on theology and what it means to be Muslim and non-communal in Pakistan. A paper of mine, published in 2013, highlights, that, highlights the work of Abu Hashim, who was the founder, founder director of the Islamic Academy and also one of the key organizers of the Muslim League. Hashim's many volumes that connected theological elaborations to the needs of, the, of Pakistan and the survival of Bengaliness within it offered ways to carve out the sovereignty of Bengali Muslims even in the face of economic, cultural, and political marginalization. An extension of Hashim's line of thinking lay in the Islamic socialism of Bhashani, where an egalitarian reading of Islam foregrounded the call for democracy and redistributive justice. In Bangladesh, would the grounding of secularism in a removal of religion from politics also reduce Bhashani's Islam to a phenomenon that needed to stay out of the public domain? To what ends? It is an absence of these cultural and political nuances and their ability to shape a Muslim identity and Muslim ethic that calls to secularism had paid little attention to. Akhil Bilgrami writes that substantive secularism is one that links through interreligious and communal conflicts, not, uh, not a mere absence of religious politics by advocating normative structures only, but a system where normative structures are amenable to contextualization. In this, there would need to be very clear ideas about what this absence of religion from politics entails. And in order to achieve that, how one would have to frame their own personal, personal and political project of secularism. While Bilgrami would perhaps argue, given the illusions and omissions I have just mentioned, and what Bangladesh began with was not, uh, that what Bangladesh began with was not a substantive form of secularism. However, the definition of secularism here is still predicated on the norm that religion must have some kind of a distance from the public and political space. There is a debate between thinkers such as Akhil Bilbrami and Rajiv Bhargav, whose work center on a working out of what that distance should be 
and others such as Hussein Ali Abrama, for example, who in the Asadian tradition would argue that the understanding of secularism on the basis of normatives is a fallacy, a premise that never holds up to sociological and political realities. Much recent work, even Habermas's 1996 a revision on his thesis on the public sphere argues that the framing of the secular as a political process, sociological real reality, and ethos that ensures religion stays within the realm of the private is in fact a product of a blinkered view of modernity. Thus, the more useful way to imagine secularism is not through constant looking up to some normative structures, but by focusing on what Agrama refers to as the indeterminacies or the suspicions that are at the heart of what makes secularism a dynamic and ever-changing project. In the post-1975 era, what happened in 1975 was Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who's the father of the nation, was assassinated, and we really had um, a regime change, and the, and the Awami League, which, uh, which fought during, which, which was in power right after independence, was out of power for the next 21 years. So the post-1975 era, when the word secularism was pulled out of the Constitution, and Islam was made the state religion, the prime modality of secularization of separating religion from politics was reversed, and the Jamaati Islami and Muslim League were allowed to play active roles in politics. This is widely conceived of the era that began to do away with secularism as a serious <coughs> commitment. One of the moves of the government of Zia Rahman was to ground the identity and ethos of the nation not on Bengali nationalism, but rather Bangladeshi nationalism, which claimed to be more inclusive of both ethnicities and religions, notably Islam. While finally an embrace of one's religious moorings pleased many, the escalating influence of Jamaat in the public space, an inflow of money from the oil-rich Gulf states to fund madrasas and other charitable projects, etc., left others worried that a Muslim majoritarian ethos may be creeping in. After the democratic transition of 1990, as the Jamaat Islami became a key political ally to the BNP, this coalition was largely thought to have nurtured problematic religious forces some of them even violent and militant, such as the currently banned Jamaat al-Mujahid in Bangladesh, or JMB. It's an it's a outfit that's been named a terror outfit. Um, also has established some um, links with ISIS in recent years. Consequently, initiatives to restore secular ideals and practices in society, and secularism as a political construct not constitutionally became the army league's promise to the nation and foreign stakeholders once they were voted back in power. As a part of delivering on this promise, the current Awami League regime has heavily policed Islamists and are watchful of Islamic events and gatherings. The trial of the war criminals from 1971, most of who are high-ranking leaders of the Jamaat Islami, has brought to surface the question of Jamaat's legitimacy as a, as a political party. While constitutionally allowed, there is a huge resurgence of the discourse that sees the removal of religious politics as a key restoring device of secularism. In fact, this was a major call of the Shabbat movement of 2013. Advocates argue that it is this that will greatly curb the Muslim majoritarianism exemplified through the persecution of minor minorities, the grabbing of their land, and the destruction of their property. But aligned with Islamic forces, is not the sole purview of the Bangladesh Nationalist Party or BNP. In recent years, the Awami League government has kept the hifazat -e islam that rose to prominence after the Shahbag movement of, the two of 2013 at a certain proximity. While many argue that this is unbecoming of their secular stance, others see it as political expediency. And yet others see it as how politics must unfold today. However, just as the reintro reintroduction of religious politics in 1977 stitched up some cleavages, picking the Hifazat up as a potential political ally also placates certain nationalist wounds. They comprise, Hifazat comprises essentially of Qaumi Madrasa students, many of which, many of whom had taken uh, an open pro-1971 stance. 
differentiating themselves from the Jama'at. While the demands put forth by Hifazit were abhorred by secularists, there were, there were concerns that this was also a class backlash that was inevitable. Many progressives thought that Bangladesh had not done itself any favors by demonizing poor people for their religious orientation, equating religiosity with regression when the root, root issue was really poverty. When the government recognized the Daura degree of the Kaumi Madrasa in April 2017, the class consideration took away the religious anxiety for many who took a wait and watch approach, arguing that this may not be an altogether bad move on the part of the government. However, when a few months later, Hifazat had demanded that certain communal, quote unquote, content written by Hindu and Lalun poets be removed from textbooks in order to preserve the religious cultural integrity of the majority secularists, uh, uh, in order to preserve the religious cultural integrity of the majority, um, the majority of the secularists had wondered whether any sense of class sympathy had pushed the cultural boundaries too far. What was clear was that the government was riding the Hifazat tiger and that it would be the new Islamist force to contend with. Many may argue that where Bangladesh is now is the result of a lack of political will or sheer political expediency, or the functioning of a bankrupt democratic system. That somehow, if we had done it better, nurtured better civic and democra democratic values, we would have steered the course of our secular trajectory more in line with secular, more capacious values. But I would argue that what we have now is a result of suspicions and indeterminacies left on the trails of progress of the nation. Without speaking to those suspicions and trying to address them, pers pursuing secularism is not only insubstantive and anachronistic, but also futile. In a country that aspires set to secularism, the courts are one place where one hopes tolerance as a cornerstone of, a secular, of the secular may deliver. At least, this is how the secular constitution had envisioned it. But how does secularism play out in the courts? In Bangladesh, there have not been too many legal cases fought over religious freedom, perhaps as few as five in the higher court. Most legal battles with minority groups are either criminal or property arbitration cases. In the face of escalating violence against minorities, what can we make of the court's capacity when cases do arrive there to be bearers of religious freedom? I want to de delve briefly into the plight of the Ahmadiyyas and how their persecution plays out legally. So just a brief history of the Ahmadiyyas in Bangladesh. The Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat began to attract a few followers in the first decades of the 1900s, and by 1912, they had a, a fairly good movement in Brahmanbaria, which is a district outside Dhaka. Um, at present, members of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat are found in different parts of the country, actually all parts of the country. Um, the Ahmadiyya community of Bangladesh is reported to consist of 103 <laughs> locally organized Jamaats, which carry out different activities um, uh, regarding their communities under the leadership of local Amirs. Financially, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat relies on contributions from members who are set to donate 1 16th of their income towards common funds. So unlike other parts of the Indian subcontinent as a whole, where opposition to the Ahmadiyya movement was observed from the outset, organized acts of violence uh, against its followers were not very common during the British period. Um, during the British period. Even when violence broke out against the community in 1953 in West Pakistan, East Pakistani Ahmadis claimed to have not felt much. During the entire Pakistan period, only one single anti ahmadiyya incident happened um, in 1963. In Bangladesh, however, organized hostilis hostilities towards the Ahmadis were rarely observed before the late 1980s, when the Khatmi Nabuak movement started agitating against them. Since 1987, the Khatmi Nabuat has perpetrated much agi agitation and even violence against the Ahmadis, including forcefully taking over Ahmadiyya mosques, attacking communities and headquarters, burning down libraries, killing Ahmadiyya followers and clergy, and threatening their annual jalsas. In 2018, there have already been three incidents, a bomb attack in the head office, the denial of permission to hold a regional convention, and an anti-Ahmadiyya rally in the Chittagong Hill Tracks. 
It is important to note that with all the agitation, violent attacks, and propaganda that come their way, the Ahmadis have never approached the legal system for justice. They usually look for reprieve through non-political channels. Cases have been filed by the police in instances of violent attacks. However, it's unclear to Ahmadis if these complaints are ever heard and a just verdict delivered. There have been three cases filed against them that fall under religious freedom. The court in all three have said that they are in no position to arbitrate measures of faith and religious identity. However, in one case in 2003, their publications were proscribed, and in, a, in, in another, the court's verdict that they cannot be declared non-Muslim was complicated over a property issue where the plaintiff intimidated a man who had in, entered a legal contract to sell a plot of land to the Ahmadiyya community for the construction of a mosque and a community center. The Ahmadiyya community filed a case, but 14 years on, they have not yet gained possession of the land. In the 2003 case that banned their publications, the court justified this by saying that their verdict aims to protect the Ahmadiyyas from facing further agitation which only served to bolster the Katmina Kat Nabuat move movement. However, after a writ petition filed by the Ahmadiyyas, the court stayed the order. 15 years later, the matter stands as is, without any more objections brought to the court. The Ahmadiyyas have been advised by the lawyers to lie low and go about their um, lives the best they can. How can we gauge the situation through the lens of religious freedom as it plays out in the courts in Bangladesh? Noted human rights lawyer Sara Hussein, who has defended the Ahmadiyyas in court, argues that while the superior judiciary can still provide some, some reprieve, a stronger separation between the executive and the judicial and a neutering of regressive religious forces are essential ingredients to ensuring the life of secular principles and democracy. She points out that the courts have never taken action against the writers' groups for inciting violence and agitation, and that greater separation of powers will be able to ensure greater secular and democratic justice. But is it really as formulaic as that? Recent literature by scholars such as Sabah Mahmood, Elizabeth Hurd, Winifred Sullivan on religious freedom, stemming from the Asadian premise that secularism as a modality of state regulation decides for its own consolidation of power where the separation between religion and state should lie, and defines the religious and non-religious accordingly. These insights argue that religious freedom is quite the chimera that fails to deliver the freedoms liberalism promises, and that in fact it is the majority that is always served. While that may be true, Others, such as Sadia Saeed, who has worked on Ahmadiyyas in Pakistan, points out that to see secularism as only an extension of state control <coughs> denies the importance of state-society relations through which we can see how states may take different positions at different times, as it has done on the Ahmadiyya question in Pakistan, unfortunately culminating in their being declared non-Muslim in 1984. While there are many ways in which state-society relations can be assessed, in my overview of how the story of secularism unfolded in Bangladesh, I have discussed how the secular was constructed more through elisions than a sociological, political, and intellectual wrestling that links the past to future vis visions. This, in turn, also constitutes part of the state-society rela relations, especially, especially as it as it reaches towards the question of religion in general and Muslimness in particular. In the current political climate, as the government continues to tout secularism while courting the Hefazir, the state-society relations will be impacted not only by a sedimentation of old elisions, but new kinds of alliances that, that bring to the fore particular ethno-religious imaginings that reflect fissures deeper than vote bank politics. If we return to the Ahmadiyya situation, we see that Hifazat also asks that the group be declared non-Muslim. The Islamic Foundation, whose director gen general is a government appointee, took out a book in 2011 titled Funeral of the Qadiani. During the early years of his tenure at the foundation, 
He had been heard saying incriminating things about the Ahmadiyyas, equating them to Jamaatis, arguing both are aberrations in Islam that should not be allowed in Bangladesh. This sort of a statement from government authorized personnel creates new equations between Islamic groups and poses new challenges for a secular quote unquote government and its religio ethical messaging and political convictions. By allowing some kind of equivalence between Jamaatis and Ahmadiyyas, something that Ahmadis find absolutely astounding, what would government actors be suggesting that both these groups' position on true Islam is wrong? <coughs> that both are somehow challenging the role that the government is supporting its new allies? It's not altogether clear, but what is clear is that new kinds of rival rivalries also bring new pacts and equations into the fore along different ethical religious formulations that cut across groups and old alliances. As historical suspicions culminate in new directions, as states pursue a myriad of goals that are not always liberal, what are the options left to minority groups that, are, that also underpin ethical religious positions and want to remain as vibrant religious communities in Bangladesh? As depressing as it may sound, I argue that the suspicions, rivalries, one-sided histories, and troublesome theologies are what determine this quote unquote secular space and the aspirations within it. It's difficult to make predictions based on the precarity that arises from this. But the point that I would like to make is that secularism is and perhaps should be reconceptualized as also suggested by other scholars as the messiness carried over by history, brought under different exertions of power, and managed by both the legal and the sociocultural. While the courts have not delib deliberated as detrimentally for the Ahmadiyyas as they have in places such as Pakistan and Indonesia, the state-society relations that can bring to bear upon the ethos of the court <laughs> retain many gaps where the calculations of the political space are one of many elements that can help or hinder. In such, precar in such a precarious place, I would argue that a constant assertion of doing away with religion or relegating it to, private, to, a, to the private space, where we know what a clear separation of private and public is never tenable, advocating legalism or constitutionalism are measures that deflect from the importance of histories, interpretive traditions, relationships, attachments, and affects. It is important that religion is put back in the cauldron in an evolving conversation as, and as part of the cultural and intellectual unfolding in the aim of creating more capacious spaces and possibilities. With the question of attachment and affect, let me transition quickly and briefly from mainstream politics and the legal arena to the question of women and their bodies. I did my doctoral work on women's Quranic groups in Dhaka which advocate a pious lifestyle and through which many of Dhaka's middle classes and even some elite circles have found Islam anew. This is perplexing for many, as one wonders why women who have had many kinds of options choose to live religiously, becoming conservative, and amongst other things, donning the hijab. Many say that the hijab does not represent the Bengali culture and considers it to be an Arab infiltration resulting from the defiled secularism that the post-1975 era brought on. But the imposition of political rivalry, rivalries notwithstanding, at a deeper level on terms that are meaningful to women's lives, what does the hijab do for them? There are various kinds of secular answers to this question that range from protection from sexual harassment and greater mobility in the face of modernization to the suggestion that hijab has become a fashion. In these, the kinds of attachments women form can only be pragmatic or even superfluous. For me, the secular logic of these explanations is indebted to how women have been projected in the public space and again, the illusions extended from the cultural space onto their bodies and selves. Bangladesh lords itself over strides it has made in empowering women. Whether it is agriculture or the ready-made garment industry, women are an integral part of the story of the nation's economic development. 
Research on the lives of these women reveal quite a lot about their desires. But following the secular posturing of the nation, these women's lives have nothing to do with religion, or apparently. The, the classic example of this is the case of the war heroines, or the Bilongana, as they are referred to in Bengali. While their heroism is celebrated in their resistance to Pakistani and Jamaati oppression, their bodies, desires, and attachments are silenced in the service of a middle-class aesthetic of the sari-clad, teep-wearing, singing mother of the nation. In upholding Bengaliness through such an exteriority, she stands in opposition to religious encroachment, and when the economic conditions prevail, she internalizes religion, which renders any f physical um, expression of religion redundant, such as the parda. While such ways of engaging the parda, or the hijab, or burqa, may be true for many women in Bangladesh and elsewhere, the address to the hijab in the Quran reading classes is beyond the liberal notion of empowerment or economic determinism. So who are these women, and what does wearing the hijab accomplish for them? The women I studied belong to the upper middle to middle classes. They're educated, often fairly conversant in English. I worked in three sites that welcomed women in the ages ranging from their late teens to their 70s. Um, there was one class that was mostly for young university students and one that had older married women and one that was more mixed. In these classes, hijab is advocated as a religious obligation. Women must wear it to fulfill a religious obligation as a Muslim, a fulfilling, as fulfilling a divine command. It is true that this command is both heard and advocated contextually, where sexual integrity and traditional ideals of maleness and femaleness are key. Thus, the hijab is neither preached nor understood beyond the pale of traditional patriarchy. However, it is clear that embodying or resisting patriarchy is not the objective of the women who take the hijab. But how do they make sense of this practice? I found differences between the older and the younger women. For the older women, allowing the hijab to make them more pious had to do with feminine qualities linked to their families. They saw the good Muslim um, commensurate with the good wife and the good mother, giving to their families what they interpreted the Quran and the Sunnah as saying was due to them. The secularist anxiety that the hijab recreates pristine old world lives unquestioningly, however, is punctured by how women find a new sense of power as wives and mothers. By speaking of their intimate lives and even revealing that they have rediscovered their sexual potency, of course, only in relation to their husbands, <laughs> women lend their bodies to a certain practice of veiling and attendant virtues in a way that the body is neither beyond the consciousness of the mind, nor is the Bengali Muslim Bengali woman, one, one that is devoid of agency. The younger women are less comfortable with the hijab for a variety of reasons, including its ad address to ideals of femininity that the older women are not so concerned to question. For them, the pursuit of piety is a much more fragmented matter, and I have come across many young women questioning what they learn and experimenting with the hijab and then taking it off. While this is easily read by a secular logic as women finally realizing the oppressive nature of the hijab, women re retain certain religious and ethical attachments where the body does not conform to an individualistic rationality devoid of social and religious accountability. The unveiled women, woman, unveiled Muslim woman who has been affected by the Quran discussion group cultivates her interiority in a way where her bodily engagements and the ensuing ethics of self and society cannot be defined by secular assumptions of what the unveiled woman must feel or do. These complexities speak to both the religious body in ways that the images and aesthetics of the secular body cannot convey. 
In my talk, I've tried to think about Bangladeshi secularism through its various proclamations, the illusions of history, the illusions of personhood, and finally, through the complex attachments by which women's bodies are made to stand in opposition to the secular. This discussion does not seek to render the term secular, secularism or its applications redundant. What I would like this talk to follow on to is a more critical wrestling with relationships between people and relationships to oneself in informing the definitional and operational contours of secularism as an ideal and practice that accommodates, that tolerates, and perhaps even celebrates diversity. Mm -hmm. There are some initiatives that I've been engaged in, such as hosting forums, facilitating interfaith dialogues, in engaging youth in action, etc., that I, along with others, feel are important routes to rethinking and redoing the secular in a fraught political terrain. I'd, happy to, I'd be happy to speak about these and also hear your comments and ideas next. Thank you. So we'll take some questions now. What would you be willing to say more about with regard to your last point that um, <coughs> that when younger women, you were talking about specifically, uh, stop wearing a hijab, outsiders look at this and say, oh, you know, they've decided to be individualists and so on. But you're talking about this nexus of uh, influences meaning and other stuff that's much uh, more complicated the interior stuff that's going on there. Could, could you say a little more about what some of those things are? Maybe it should be obvious from everything else you said. No, um, actually I could have elaborated and I thought maybe I'd include some quotes, but I was worried about running over time. So I'm happy you asked that question. So the reason why I talk about that uh, uh, in reference to the younger women is um, because we're young, it's, it's difficult. You know, the norms of piety and the dictates of piety, and then you've got the other life, which is more secular, liberal, more fun, you know, happening. And I think as women are transitioning into adulthood, there's sort of, uh, you know, prospects of work, being in the workplace, um, you know, pursuing <laughs> further education, and also, you know, trying to, uh, uh, come into their own skin um, as, mm -hmm. as women, but also as, as sexual women. So there's always a tension that's there. Um, what I found, so that tension is actually rife in these discussion circles amongst the younger women. I mean, they don't really talk about it in front of the preacher, but when you start talking to them, you'll see all kinds of negotiations back and forth. I identified a few women who left the hijab. And what happens is when you leave the hijab, um, you're sort of almost thrown out of these groups. Or they make it so hard for you that you have to be really tough to stay in there, right? So, um, so for example, one girl who left the hijab, the preacher, who was also a young wo woman, actually, called her up and really said that you've, um, you've totally let us down. You give us a bad name, and you were totally our brand ambassador before. How could you do this? Mm -hmm. And so it's very hard for them to navigate this terrain. But what does leaving the hijab or what does becoming this now non-hijabi person mean for her? And very interesting, what she said to me is when she was in the hijab, she carried those, uh, those images very effectively, as the preacher said. She, she indeed was a brand ambassador. So she recruited friends, she recruited people, cousins into the class who also changed and you know, took on the hijab and other kinds of things that, you know, you have to do for, uh, as part of piety, you know, pious requirements. Um, but she says, after I'd started doing that, I felt like I stagnated, my piety or my, my spirituality stagnated. And she said, I no longer was thinking about exerting in the way of God. I was very happy to, with the image that I was giving out. And what I found myself doing later is not even praying, which is the basic, the five prayers is whether you're in hijab or not, when you come to these classes, that's what you start with, right? And she says, I wasn't even um, praying anymore, and I didn't 
you know, and I didn't feel guilty. I felt guilty, but it didn't matter because everybody assumed that I must be this devout person. And then, of course, there were other experiences. She, you know, had a boyfriend who was also pious, and they were going through their own kind of spiritual journey together. There were these you know, requirements of piety that said, you know, can't, you know, what should be the boundaries of their relationship, and so on and so forth. So when she decided to leave the hijab, she said, I've got to reconnect with God. And the only way I can do it is by letting this go. So this was a clean slate for her. And now that she's reconnecting, she says very clearly, I don't know where I'm going with this. I've started reading again. Because once you come to these classes, you really start reading. And you're watching YouTube videos, you're watching lectures, you're reading things, you're bringing things to class. And she said, I had stopped, I'd stagnated, I've gone back to my reading and I'm reading everything. I'm reading economics, sociology, and going back to all kinds of ways of thinking about Islam, Christianity, religion. So she said to me, I might like to wear the hijab again, but I've got to know why. And it's got to be meaningful. So this is really a, a, a fairly rich narrative, I think, mm -hmm. that doesn't quite do justice to the simplistic binaries of you know, wearing it, taking it off, being individualistic, or being bound by religion. So does that help? Well, first, thank you for a, a, a very careful and serious talk. And, um, well, let me start with the invitation you asked us at the end, which is to elaborate more on, on how you think about um, a reformed secularism. And I suppose the other invitation you ask us is that when you say that Assad decide, or Assad secularism decides where the divide shall lie. The state. The state, yeah. oh, where, where the, oh, the. Well, Assad sort of says the, state, yeah. the state decides. Decides where the divide shall lie. The secular how is the, state. The state, yeah. the secular state. How, how is reform of secularism not just shifting the goalpost a bit, and is that a problem? Well, I think, you know, I'm not really being trained in political science. I'm sort of yeah. tentative to go there, because I think how, I mean, the fundamental question is how do you change the nature of the state if you're going to change, you know, how the state decides where the boundaries lie, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and I, in my talk, I framed it in terms of state-society relations. But I also say that it could be a number of ways, right? Um, I think, so for example, one of the things I talk about is the rise of the Hifazat, which is, you know, I don't think it's, I, I don't think any of us are really, other than perhaps Hifazat, other than, you know, any of us are really excited about it. But I don't think the formula, I mean, I think the state will do what it does. It has its own pursuit of power, right? And discipline and all of that. Um, but I think one of the things, and what I've said is, if we look at kind of the discourses that are circulating, the terms by which they're articulating their claims, the terms uh, by which they're making new kinds of political pacts, I think if we take all of that into consideration, I think that, that you know, it's like I said, it's a cauldron, it's a mess. There's many things in it, right? <coughs> but I think, if I can push this, you know, it may even be productive. Provided, and the state is not going to do this, provided, you know, a bunch of us, a bunch of, you know, activists, a bunch of scholars, a bunch of students, young people, know what that messiness entails. Because, you know, you've had, uh, you know, nothing stays static, right? I mean, you have all kinds of unholy alliances that lead to sometimes something that is capacious something that is better than what it could have been, right? So I'm very tentative. I mean, I, I don't think we're going to have a very dramatically different system in the very near future. But I want to point towards the messiness as productive. You know, instead of constantly thinking about these ideals, these norms that, you know, I mean, I think there's a whole bunch of literature out there from Charles Taylor to Jose Casanova, for not, not even Muslim parts of the world, who say that, you know, those norms are just norms, you know. Mm. You, can, you can approximate, you can come to some kind of an approximation, but the roots are not really cleared out any in any kind of a 
you know, simple teleology of, of progress or modernity. So. Can I follow up with a quick, just, and this is uh, partially space that I go into, so you may just need to help me, but, but I mean, Hafaza seems to in part operate as a kind of third space, and that mm -hmm. it troubles, you know, the, the conventional ways in which debates on secularism can be thought about, and, it, uh, and it's very grounded in, in uh, not only, you know, emergencies, and it's, it's, is the immense popularity of the Tabliki Jamaat as a, as a reformist movement also a kind of third space? I it's think. huge. Yeah. It's absolutely huge. So, for example, when for my madrasa research, I go to I go outside Dhaka to villages, yeah. and um, you know, there's this kind of very superficial binaries between the Awami League that were for 71, that are staunchly secular, and you know, they only do good religion versus the Jamaat that, that's done bad religion, you know, and then you've got the Tabligh Jamaat, um, which is Oh, they're fine. You know, they're, they're, you know, they they just talk about God. So I, I I remember being in a village and I had um, we wanted to talk about some kind of uh, people that are prominent in their communities and there was this very lovely wise old man who had been a freedom fighter and he's a Nawami League sort of mobilizer even today in the village and he's gotten several awards. And I wanted to talk, and he, he is known as somebody who has promoted women's education. So his daughters, even his daughters-in-law, he's always ensured that they get their degrees, that they have jobs. And um, I sat with them. So he's, I mean, he's, he's sort of described as somebody who's liberal in the bastion of what you know, Bangladesh you know, patriotism should be. And so we, order, we organized an FGD in his house, and his, his daughters, daughters-in-law, their friends, they'd all come. And when I'm doing field work in Dhaka, I don't dress like this. <laughs> so outside <laughs> Dhaka, I don't dress like this. So I had a big shalwar kameez on, and you know, I had a big dupatta on, my head covered, and we all sat, and we were chatting, we sat on the floor. And then, um, and then suddenly one of the girls said to me, um, you know, your outfit is not Sunnati. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your outfit is not Sunnati. And I said, oh. You know, my antenna kind of went up, like there's something here. And I said, really? But, but look, I, you know, I have this big shawar kameez, I've got the dupatta. He said, no, when you sit, your ankle can be shown. Mm -hmm. oh, no, that's the bleak jamaat. That's the bleak jamaat, right? So I was like, uh, do you girls go to religious discussion circles? And they're like, yes, yes, of okay. course, of course. And of course I said, can you take me? And went along with them. <laughs> but, but um, uh, you know, and so I went, and then finally after this, I went to this man, this Awami League organizer, and I said, um, so you have these tarims, right, that happen? He said, yeah. I said, so that doesn't that doesn't um, sort of interfere with your projects of you know doing good for your community. And no, they're public mm -hmm. They're very good. They just they just you know help us to remember God. Mm -hmm. So public jamaat is huge because of their apolitical positioning. They're completely under the radar, you know, mm -hmm. and and in fact they don't talk about politics. So it doesn't matter as far as the governments are concerned. But in terms of changing the landscape, <coughs> yeah, it's huge. Um, it's a little follow-up to this, really, um, to Lawrence's wonderful question and to your wonderful answer. But I was thinking, even as you were talking about sort of secularism as, as um, you want to sort of recuperate the sort of messiness of secularism, but it seemed to me when you were talking that what you're actually doing is you are recuperating the messiness of religion. That you're actually showing, um, I mean, you can show it from the point of view of secularism, but what you're actually showing yeah. um, in your answer about the young girl uh, to the gentleman over here is that there is a way in which these young girls are embodying that messiness those lines, those transitions, the, the, the capacity to live simultaneously religious and secular sort of existence in different spheres and try to bring them together, sometimes 
cleanly, sometimes messily. So I'm wondering whether um, it is in fact accepting the, the messiness of uh, uh, the, the possibilities of a messy religious existence can help you think about the secular, as opposed to the messiness of the secular. Right. Uh, well, I think, I think most of what I've said is about the messiness of religion. You're absolutely right, right? But I think how my, in terms of the point of think for me, the point of thinking about the messiness of religion is not to do away with the idea of the secular. So I want to bring it back to that. Or, I don't know, would it evolve into calling us, into us calling it something else? I don't know. Well, in that you seem to be wanting the state to be secular. In, in this but way. even that is problematic, right? The, uh, the modalities in which they have tried to operationalize the secularism have too many fault lines. So, so I don't know. I'm not. I'm not as convinced as, let's say, Akhil Bilrami or Rajiv Parvav that that the state <coughs> has got it right. Yeah. Right. So, I don't know. I don't think I have a very strong answer. No, I mean, I think, I think these are not easy <laughs> to have a strong answer about. Mm -hmm. Yes? So I'm thinking, as I sit here, this is chaos theory. Right? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it, there's, when there's progress evolving, it seems messy, it seems wrong, and then you establish a new norm, and then you look back and you say, what was all that about? You know, let me understand that so different now. But I'm, you know, I'm sitting here as, a, as American, you know, American kind, thinking, oh my God, this is what's happening in our country right now, mm -hmm. that we're trying to stuff the courts with conservative religious thinkers that would change for decades, probably, the way women are treated, the way. And I'm wondering in your study if you have found global themes, because this is not just happening in Bangladesh, it's also happening throughout the world for some reason. Absolutely. I mean, I think there's, um, I mean, we, we, we just have to switch on the television and watch the news to see what's happening all over the world. Mm -hmm. And there is this kind of resurgence of, of religion in certain kinds of shades and hues that we're seeing in most parts of the world. Now, I would say that I don't think that's just a sudden thing. I mean, I think perhaps it's been coming. Perhaps there's something in the history and in the unfolding of history that if we had not been so sold to the promise of either secularism or modernity, that it would always you know, work out like that. If we had kept our eyes on some of the more sociological elements, I think perhaps we could have you know, I mean, I th that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to bring it back to these, you know, societal elements, relationships, how we think about ourselves, in how, and, and in that, where religion comes in, um, in various ways, to think about what then this secular might be. So I don't really have a definition in place for any of this, but. Which is good, that's probably a good thing. Uh, thanks, Samia. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the work you're doing, the other work you said at the end, the interfaith dialogues and those kind of things. I mean, and what, what are the ultimate goals of that? And what have you seen happen as a result so far? Okay, so, I, you know, my job, as I said in, in the paper as well, that I'd like to put religion back into the cauldron. So I, at the risk of being labeled a jamati, a tabliki, and whatnot, <laughs> that's what I sort of talk about. That's what I advocate, that listen, we have to have a conversation about religion. So most of my um, academic, non-academic, slash semi-academic work of organizing is, is centered around that. So I ran a speaker's forum in collaboration with Georgetown University for three years, where we looked at the question of development, which is a very important one for Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And that's really what Bangladesh is known for, Grameen Bank, BRAC, microcredit, you know, mm -hmm. um, things like that. So the development actors have a really big say in, uh, in 
projecting Bangladesh and thinking about Bangladesh and forecasting for Bangladesh. And yet, we've actually had faith-inspired development actors forever. From the 16th century, from when the Sufi shrines were set up, the Kankas, you know, and they actually do a lot of community stuff. And some of them, of course, there are those that have gotten money from the Middle East and, you know, ha have become very, sort of, are sort of very modern in that sense. But there are all, and there's, of course, um, you know, evangelical Christianity which came, which came to South Asia, which have also worked in, uh, in development. Uh, but there are lots of faith-inspired actors. So one of the things I did was to put the secular development actors and the faith-inspired development actors in a conversation. To think about the work they do, there's quite a lot of commonality, and there may be some, in a way, as a way for us to also tease out what some of the differences might be, in terms of how they envision communities, their selves, you know, the cosmology, you know, where is the role of change? How does and should change happen? To treat, really try to bring out and tease out some of those understandings for ourselves. You know, sort of that, that was the academic purpose. But the, the putting them in conversation was actually really fantastic. Mm -hmm. They said that it's never been it's done. Never, I was just going to say it's probably never been done. No, it really yeah. has never been done. Because the faith inspired actors just talk to themselves, and the secular actors talk to themselves. But they're all talking about a community where it's not just they who live, right? So that's one, that's one thing that we did. Um, I will carry on some of that uh, work, hopefully, if it comes through. And, um, and then um, I, do, I do that with my students as well. So for example, I plug them into some student initiatives outside Dhaka um, that are actually run by the Mennonites. So what I, why you why? Yeah, I mean they do this kind of Mennonite piece kind of stuff, and I found it interesting because what they did is they get um, students together to make interfaith journeys all over Bangladesh. So they visit, you know, shrines, churches, temples that have fallen into ruins. And you know, this is completely non-academic, where young people just meet each other and they reflect on the site and they reflect on the history mm -hmm. and then they come back and follow up on it. So it's really a very sort of non-academic initiative, but more and more I've been doing that. Um, yeah, so with the youth and with the development practitioners, that's sort of what I've been doing. And I get invited to interfaith things, you know, talk sometimes. <laughs> By the Ahmedias, they like me. <laughs> well, I'm just thinking about that moment where you, you um, cite Sarah Hussar Hussain and, and uh, who wants a stronger um, neutering, and you use the phrase and, uh, from her, and it, it and I, w I couldn't help myself because then later when you talk about uh, how women um, find a new sense of power, and you mentioned rediscovered sexual potency. I wanted to think a bit about the figure of neutering, and it's 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 um, the uh, and in part I, it makes me go back to various conversations on the growth of Kolkata and, and the rise of the Badrulok and people like Samantha Banerjee and others for whom the policing of Jatra, the the, the uh, in some sense the stabilization or neutering of, of a certain kind of. Uh, uh, of Walter Peter's space is, 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 uh, is produced. And, and so I was trying to think more broadly about some of the stakes. And, and so that led to a, this is a vague, non quite question, maybe there's something in it that you can pull up. But it's, so I was trying to think about what might be at stake in the, in trying to think about um, sex gender in relationship to, to all of this. And, and in part, you also, I mean, one of the contemporary sites that I, I start with would be the question of textile labor, the question of, and I in part take this, I mean, jumbling stuff together, but through Raka's work, I mean, the question of specific uh, and gender specific differences um, in the kind of aspirational careers of people's relationships to nurse circuits of capital and, and uh, employment. And um, so 
So I'm, I'm quite interested in under the particular economic conditions of substitution that are emergent and the particular forms of gendered careers that emerge, um, the ways in which forms of, of work on the self and the world, which are religious, become central. The diversity of the kinds of careers, the messiness that Ruck was addressing and you were addressing, you know, the, the uh, uh, come out. So yeah, I guess the, the one version of this is is to how is the specificity of recent forms of capital and and, uh, and their gendering feed into the question of, of religious emergence and to the extent that there is are different pathways which may be for lack of a word be male pathways in relationship to capital and aspiration which may not and again I'm I'm entirely inappropriately pulling something out of your work, but it, 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 where, where um, these may not be uh, always as, well, I mean, the, 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 that resentment might emerge, that, that the series of concerns around, uh, uh, around uh, aspiration and uh, economy more as sites of male failure might emerge. And, and so I'm trying to think about the politics, both the religious, you know, becoming and women's religious becoming, and the complexities of of male positioning. This is very crude. The the in relationship to the economics of, of, of textile labor and the different careers, the gendered careers of aspiration. I mean, that's it's a way I'll feel. Yeah, I don't know. This is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but they're all very very important points. I mean, you know, uh, I think. The relationship with the economics is not is something that is not something that I foreground in my work, but it's definitely there in the side in the sidelines, and um, I don't really speak to you know sort of this condi conditions of being under millennial capitalism and what that means for the question of the religious subject. Um, in the case of the groups that I looked at. Um, a lot of people say this is, you know, this is just the rich man's fancy. You know, this is what happens under kind of these advanced conditions of millennial capitalism. And there's a lot of, and actually in these groups, there is a lot of justification of wealth that happens. A justification of wealth? Oh. You know, look at look at wealth as as a baraka, as a gift from God, mm -hmm. right? Especially for the older lot. Um, uh, so there is a lot of <coughs> making sense of some of the kind of, you know, economic fault lines um, that, that we see are happening. Um, in terms of the male, the failures of the male, I don't know, Rafa, if I remember that one piece of yours, that I was thinking, where I think you talk about um, sort of the, the anxiety around work, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I didn't get that. These are much more affluent um, classes to begin with, right? Um, within these affluent classes, you will find that you know there's a way in which they deal with male failures, but it's not quite the same as what you would find in the Bastis. So I, I really am talking about the affluent classes, and but I mean these these classes that you know. You you may have been studying the classes in a particular affluent sector, but when you went to the village, you know, the, that in that in that group, they were not affluent. They, in fact, talked about, they, they attend those classes there. Mm -hmm. So if I could just sort of put, so do you have the figure of the, the textile worker, female, the development, uh, the recipient of development aid, female, right? So the mean, the, the the creator of microfinance, male, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But if you think about the gender of these like powerful figures that that, we, that come out of Bangladesh, it is really interesting when you think about them juxtaposed with sort of the, the forms of uh, religious and secular thinking that are also sort of emerging mm -hmm. the, um, amongst these populations, mm -hmm. amongst the, the, the tech. You know, when, when we were talking well, about the interface, you know, when you have sort of secular development people and religious development people, 
right? I mean, how do, so, so that's, it's, 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 a, it's how do you think, how do they think about gender, right? The development secular people, we know. That's a lie. We know that. We don't know how the faith developer people think about gender, right? So I'm right that people are not. <laughs> 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 but, um, but no, but just to go back yeah. to, so for example, the figure of the textile, textile worker. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of research that's been done on garment workers. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that I've said is we don't really know about their religious attachments. What we know is, let's say, the, the very famous work by Naila Kabir is, um, you know, she talks about something called Monir Parda, or Parda of the heart, right? So she says that, you know, as, and, and I think the argument yeah. is, is that as women come, and also there is a lot of precarity and messiness in their lives. A lot of them don't have husbands, they're abandoned. Um, you know, they must make do, must have, must be the head of the household. Um, and that's also the reality of, of life for a lot of these women. Um, you know, and she says that while there's a lot of um, precarity, but because of economic necessities, right, and opportunities, she just becomes stronger for it. And slowly you see that she will start to say, but I need money, my, my money porta is enough. Why must I be judged for how I dress? I should be judged for my interiority, right? And that Naila Kabir brings out very, um, uh, very nicely, and I don't have a, I don't have a bone of contention with that actually because that may be true. It may be true that under certain economic, uh, you know, conditions of economic greater economic op opportunities, women feel freer from it. If this was an exertion upon them before that, mm -hmm. um, also as women come up, come out of their uh, communities. You know, they ha I think they're less bound by traditional norms. So women are now coming from rural settings to urban settings working. Having said that, um, we don't really, so in that, why do women veil, for example, is because I just, it's mobility, it's protection, it's, and, and like I said, that narrative is there. It's not like that narrative is not true, right? But when they do veil, either because they are, I mean, for example, women can go to Thaleem and can decide this is not for me and come up. And there are many women who come for a day or two and they're like, nah, you know? But women who stay and engage with the address of veil, which is, you know, sort of given to you as a divine obligation, right? Above and beyond who else wants it, there could be a different form of attachment that even the garment worker forms. That work has not been done. I don't know. Um, there are some friends of ours who are, who've talked about this, that there's a shift among gar garment workers as well in the last 20 years since Naila Kabir wrote her book. I don't know. It's possible. Well, I want to thank you for not only a great talk, but a really stimulating sort of conversation. I think right. that all of us are just really thinking about these really difficult, complex, and, and sort of fascinating possibilities that you have put forth. So thank you so much for your work and for coming here. And thank uh, you. I think there's a little reception outside if people want to join us afterwards. So thank you. Thank you.